Thank you and uh, welcome. Yeah, indeed, we're going to do a joint presentation, but we didn't have time enough to study it as a real per two persons act, so you get one act after the other. But after that, we have formulated uh, five questions which will distribute around the table. You get about 10 minutes per table to try to come up with some, some good answers to the questions from your perspective. And then we'll have a reporting session back from the tables. Um, so we're looking forward to an exciting, uh, say, hour and a half, we hope. Um, my presentation will, and I think that's the commercial end, in uh, when you OBV means limited. I mean, then you understand we're just in business. BV is something uh, Dutch, which means limited. Um, there are two aspects in my presentation. Uh, one is that I'll show you the business model, which is strongly related to innovation as we handle it in my company. But the other is, we're also here because we're interested uh, to expand our business, possibly into Canada. So we're here to find business partners. And uh, I'm not going to explain that much further because I think being in a company, that's the only thing where you really go for. And I'm excited to be here. This is, if you talk about drivers for me as a company, I mean for me and for my company, this is our main driver. And this is an interesting, it's a nice figure. It comes from, uh, it was published and used a lot by Tristan uh, Stewart. And it tells us about uh, that we don't have any food problem in the whole world. Because if you divide the kilocalories harvested in this world by the population, we have about uh, 4,500 kilocalories per person. Uh, and that's more than enough. But we waste quite a bit of that. Um, we waste about 600. It's indicated 1,600, but that's not correct if you look to the graph. Uh, we waste about uh, 600 uh, kilocalories in the post-harvest losses. Then we waste a lot of calories by making it into animal feed. And we get out a little bit, but we waste about 1,200 calories by uh, making meat of, uh, of good, of, um, of fr freshly harvested product. And then, of course, we still lose a lot in processing and distribution. And I'm not going to talk about the animal feed part, but business-wise, we have always seen sustainability, and that's now past, as Kay said. But when we started 10, 12 years ago, we were looking for a sustainable uh, sustainability as a main driver in our, food, food, in our um, business model. And these are the two areas where you then look at. And it's interesting, if you wouldn't have those areas and can reduce them, then we could easily feed uh, 9 billion people from this planet. We don't need a second planet, and we didn't find it anyway. And if you look to, uh, to the food waste, this is the European perspective, uh, especially in the vegetables and in the rooted products, the wastes are uh, big. Up to 50% of the harvested product doesn't reach, it doesn't reach the consumer, but ends somewhere, it got lost somewhere along the road. OK. We see that not as a problem, but we see that primarily as a uh, business opportunity. So our business, as we have developed it, um, is upgrading the lower grade product, the vegetables, the byproduct, all kinds of nice na uh, names, as long as you don't call it waste, uh, into high value products and ingredients. And the examples, which we also deliver on the business to business base, I'll talk about that a little later, are things like high quality vegetable juices, um, dietary fibers derived from vegetables, or carotene rich uh, natural ingredients, which, are, uh, which fit a need in the industry as an ingredient. And to make that a little more visible, if you look at the, uh, and we call it hidden vegetables. Why do we call it hidden vegetables? Um, there are health issues in the, in the, in the society related to the fact that, uh, especially children, but I think a lot of adults as well, don't eat enough vegetables. And if they don't eat enough vegetables, try, find, try to find a way to let them eat them. So bring them into a nice uh, juice. And it doesn't matter if the, the cucumber was straight or crooked before we made the juice. You don't see that anyway at that level. And also innocent is uh, because vegetables are low calorie, are uh, trying to get more 
vegetable juices in their smoothies to get the calorie load down and still have a good taste. And we are happy to be also a supplier to Innocent with some of our carrot, special carrot juice. Or make them into a cold soup. And I'm sure the gazpacho, which is the Spanish cold uh, summer soup, was originally a way for the, uh, the housewives to get rid of all that produce which comes up in the end of the summer. What do you do? Well, you make a nice soup out of it. So that's a nice opportunity for, the, say, the liquid side of the business. On the other hand, um, you also, when you are looking into vegetables and if you're separating them into a liquid fraction and a more solid fraction, uh, you end up with a product, you can call it a pulp, but you can quite easily transfer that from a pulp to a fiber. And these vegetable fibers, you can use excellent as an ingredient in many products. And what is named there are things like tapenades, instead of the olives, you can also make that nicely from uh, red beet. And it has an excellent taste. Um, you can put them into meat products as an ingredient to dilute the meat. And I'll talk about that later because I think the meat industry is uh, a good opportunity. Of course, sauces, soups, bread, meat analogs. Case talked about it as well. Um, a thriving industry in the Netherlands where especially structured meat, which is very similar in taste and in bite to, uh, to real meat, one could say. Um, they are also the vegetable um, ingredients we develop play an important role. It can go into pasta, it can go into snack, snacks. So basically we have uh, developed um, ways to do that and we, and that's one of the contrasts with the presentation of, uh, of Wilbert, um, we have decided on some key elements to file for our own patents. Um, and that's for, for an SME company, that's quite a, quite a decision. It takes time, it takes money, and you don't know if you're going to get the money back. Well, the first patent was basically the starting point of the company. I'm not going to tell you the story, but at least four investors had a patent application. It turned into a patent, and they turned that into a company. And that patent basically described that you could make vegetable juice from crooked vegetables. It's funny that it ever came through the procedure, but it gave a starting point and a sort of protection of the company. And everybody was anyway thinking that it was not worth uh, spending money on making vegetable juice in the Netherlands, so we had a free field. Um, what is a, and, uh, so that was very important in the startup, but the disadvantage is if you make a vegetable juice, you end up with a commodity product. So though your innovation in the process is excellent, even patent worth, the end product is a commodity and you comp compete with all the other guys and you end up at the price competition. So we were uh, in the business to stay there, so we also developed uh, a patent around the use of vegetable fibers as ingredients, as they have some unique characteristics we'll talk about later. We don't do make patents or file for patents because we want to keep people out of the business. We file patents because we want to be able to offer to the partners in the chains uh, a certain level of protection that you find time, you can develop time to get into business together and make money. And the protection of a patent is an excellent instrument if you are able to find a big enough application. I would never go for a single product patent. I'm not in the computer business where you can get a patent on a chip and sell a few million. In food industry, patents will always be a very limited number on a very specific area. In our case, we have decided to use it as an active um, tool in our business. So where are we today? And then I'll come to the business model. Um, we have done a lot of basic research, or we had a lot of uh, basic research, of course, was done by universities and institutes. We have more focus on the application of the research. We um, have a business opportunity opportunities identified and working on, on what I would call solid social trends. If you react on hypes, you're always too late. You have to look a little bit further in the long term. And the long term when we started the company was that sustainability was, gonna go, was going to be a, re uh, re re a requisite for companies to operate. So that was our first step. The second, of course, was health. And if you talk about health, you talk one of the aspects is fiber is gut health. So those trends, uh, and eating vegetables anyway. 
So we had two solid trends, and that's the driver in the business as well. We're operating two demonstration plants, and that means that we produce about 5,000 tons of vegetable juice annually. Uh, so it's quite a sizable, but we look at it as a way to demonstrate that uh, the, um, the system works, and then we can expand from that as well. And we deliver product to the food industry, exclusively business to business, and um, the products are successfully used. This is what I would call a little bit the, the, um, the core of the business model. Um, basically, we are a research company with ongoing research in processes and products to take the vegetables into a higher level product. On one hand, we occasionally there's some IP coming from that, and that IP will help our customers to give a protection in the chain. We add to the IP the application know-how, which we develop together with the partner. This is a 50-50 joint venture, because I don't want to invest money in areas where others are better. And we are not good at processing. We are not good at uh, having a lot of people around on the payroll, a lot of stainless steel, etc. So for that aspect, we have a joint venture with a very big carrot processor and also his facilities. Uh, there's first an important part of our raw material because carrot is one of the uh, carrying crops in our business. Uh, they have the flexibility, they have the systems, and we learn a lot there and we teach them a lot because they use our technology and from there uh, know how we can develop better technologies. And of course, finally, the market is important. So we have close contact with this is a company, uh, a separate company, which is still 100% owned by us, but we are divesting that for a part, is that we are involved in sales. So we are at the customer interface, the customer being business to business, but they tell us where the final customer is looking for. So many people, many comp or the outside looks to us as a vegetable juice producing company. That's what we are from the outside. From the inside, we are an sort of R&D company, which also produces some product. To drive this business model, um, I'll explain that a little bit with this slide. Um, on one hand, there's the business, there's the knowledge, and there's the R&D phase. And if we want to go ahead and develop, we are looking for um, R&D, uh, which is nicely financed occasionally by the EU. Uh, the EU brings projects, has a lot of money for projects, and the big R&D groups like uh, well, universities and TNO, etc., they need those funds for, uh, for their development, for their strategic programs, but they also need SMEs because otherwise they don't get the funding. So for a small um, SME as us and a relatively small um, part of the big chunks of money which are going on in these kind of projects. We are connected to all kinds of long-term research where we get inspiration from and get ideas where the next generation products, where the next generation technology might come from. And of course, we also, in the, 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 the funding which is um, governed by, by CASE, we also have some nice feasibility studies where you get some money out. We have a rule in my company on uh, cash flow management. And the cash flow is very simple. The, the cash flow which is generated in the business stays in the business. The cash flow, one could say, which is generated from these kind of projects, we spend on R&D externally. So I never have a problem on decisions on money for my R&D. The hours of my employees and myself are always for free in any project. And the money which comes in <coughs> from a third party from a fund can go to a university or an institute if we feel, or a subcontractor, if we feel they supply the right thing. And if we don't have that money, uh, we don't spend it on R&D. It's very practical, but it avoids that you get a bleeder somewhere here because it's such a nice pet project and the money runs out. Well, what is important is that we feel that we are strong in making the translation from the, say, the knowledge to the applied knowledge Applied knowledge we bring into our business cycle, there it generates money, money and of course gives a lot of feedback, which then is interesting to drive the R&D. And business is about choices. 
So our choices was and is vegetables. And especially in the beginning, every other week, there was someone saying, hey, could you do something on fruit? We said, yeah, we could do something on fruit, but we're not going to do it. We want to be a specialist in vegetables because that's a much more virgin area than the fruit. And what do you have in fruit in the Netherlands? We're not a leading region in the world for fruit because when we talk about fruit next to apples and pears, the rest is coming from uh, um, oranges and all those other things. That's a very different industry. So stay focused. Also, waste as a raw material. Even when it's not a financial driver, we are still, from our principles, always producing from waste. And from a, I call it waste here just to get it exaggerated a little bit. More than 95% of our uh, produce comes from a byproduct from the industry which was rejected for its original purpose. That means that you are in a complete different game of... Uh, we are never looking for raw materials. We're never investing in raw materials. When the orders are there, we always find it somewhere. On one hand, you, oh, that's also a choice. We were starting with an existing consumer market because we knew that at least we made a product which could sell and we had a reference on the price. And then with the fibers, we ended into new product market combination. We had no clue what the prices could be of the products, but we could have a good idea on the benefits of the products and we thought that would translate to an interesting enough price to work on that. And anyway, by producing the juice, we were at least were break even already on 70% of the product, uh, the produce which we trans uh, transferred. I mentioned the trends. Uh, well, it's clear that we have a rather scientific uh, approach in that. And very important, we, uh, we like to build new change because we think from new chains, so partners which have never worked together before, it's much more um, likely that you can develop new business going outside your original uh, comfort zone helps a lot. So if you look to the, to the product uh, which come out, um, the juices, well, you can read the typical things. Um, there are a few aspects which are interesting and that's why we built quite a nice uh, market share in Europe. Is that, oh, that was the wrong button. Um, we have a our raw material is different from the raw material used in, with our competitors. We have as a base a consumer vegetable, so not an industrial vegetable. And consumer vegetables in general are uh, grown and also in the breeding looking for taste and for high quality. You cannot afford to buy those if you do a pure industrial production. But as we take them as a byproduct, our raw material costs are low and we have an extremely high value in taste. And for vegetables that's interesting because a vegetable juice especially is not that easy to drink as a fruit juice. A fruit juice basically is sugar, acidity and little flavor. And a lot of calories. Vegetable juice is much less sugar, a very different flavor, a more subtle, subtle flavor and uh, much less calories. So you have to have the flavor right, otherwise you have a product and it doesn't taste well and it doesn't sell. But we also, and we get that because we do also year-round processing. And we, when you can do a year-round processing instead of many, uh, say, vegetable-oriented uh, companies who are doing a seasonal processing, your total investment costs and your operating, yeah, um, you have a reduced investment less fixed cost, and you have a much more level cash flow anyway over the, over the year. You don't store product and product, you don't store raw materials. So your whole cash requirement in the business is, is much less. And you're flexible if the customer, we work mostly on annual contracts, and if halfway the year they say, ah, we want to have a little bit different flavor in a juice or something like that, we didn't produce it. So we can still adjust our recipes to that. Dietary, dietary fiber. Um, why, did, why could we file a patent? Because it turned out that the way we prepare the dietary fiber, and it's a wet fiber, it's not a dry fiber, it's not a totally wet fiber, it's a semi-wet kind of product. It has a very 
interesting um, capability for moisture absorption, which leads to a, a much better structure in the, in the product. Uh, improved structure without getting um, uh, additives in the product because it comes from, you can put it on the label as vegetable. And that's, of course, not a bad quotation. Um, it's allergen free, uh, no gluten or anything. Many products which are enriched with fibers, of course, are enriched with fibers from a cereal background, so they are not applicable to uh, people who have uh, an, um, gluten intolerance. Um, of course, the gut health is very important, um, because there you, you have a driver for industries to be interested to work with that kind of uh, product. Um, and a fiber has very low calories, and I'll give you an example. Uh, a little bit in round figures for the meat industry. The meat industry, at least in the Netherlands, in Europe, is under pressure. Um, first, they have an um, ecological footprint, which is not very favorable. So um, they have a problem in there, in that. Uh, also, when you look into the, uh, think about back to the earlier graph I gave you, um, there's a lot of food going into meat, which then is not anymore available in calories to feed the population. So the meat industry is from that point in a corner where they have some problems. Uh, secondly, there are some health issues connected to meat, not to meat as such, but to meat in, uh, to the volumes of meat that are eaten by, uh, say, the Western society, and that it is, has, uh, it's pretty high in calories, it's pretty high in fat, and it's zero in fibers. And those things are not, um, those things can be repaired. And you can, uh, in any meat product, which is a processed meat, uh, so any burger type of product, it is possible to use the vegetable dietary fiber and put that into the meat, five to 10% or even higher, which has an advantage that it, the, the, the taste of the meat still is absolutely the same because those burgers are always seasoned in one way or another, so you can easily compensate for that as far as necessary. You get a fiber in a product where it has never been a fiber, so it helps uh, in the health. Um, it reduces calories, and it's cheaper. So looking at the um, uh, economics of that, uh, basically, the raw material costs for us are zero because we take vegetables, we get juice out of that, and we have a basis which we then uh, upgrade, refine into a, into a fiber. And say the transfer price from the first stage to the second stage is about 1250 euros per ton. Then we sell it to the meat industry for about the double of that. Of course, there's some, that's not all profit, there's something to be done between that. Um, and by selling this, we replace for the industry a meat, which is then another 3,750 euros, so another 1,250 higher. And they get the opportunity to make a sort of a health claim about rich in fiber or fiber present. Or This, by the way, is the most difficult part. If you talk about barriers for innovation, it is that, how do you get a meat industry salesperson telling that, oh, I have a better product because there's less meat in? Marketing of products which are very innovative, it's a very difficult story. I see some recognition around some tables, I think. So often we have, at the technical level, very quickly understanding between companies, between us and a supplier in a sort of a joint product development area, they say, oh, this is good, this is a good product, and they have to sell it in their company to their marketing and then to the retail and to the launching data, et cetera, et cetera. So we technical people are very quick, but it's the marketing which is slowing us down, I think. But this gives, just in some, some round figures, an idea that you can, instead of being a commodity vegetable business, that you can, from vegetables, build up a, a different business. And that's what we uh, are doing. So, um, for concluding remarks, where are we? 
Uh, well, I'm in Canada and I'm here because we feel that we are now after 10-12 uh, years uh, so established that we want to expand the business. We're interested to uh, build international satellites or corporations or whatever you name it. Um, see if we can create a business case with uh, other companies or industries or whatever is in between and um, go from there and whatever business I gave a few ideas on how you could s develop such a business but that's where we are I think we have a business model which as it is much more knowledge driven than physically driven that we can expand, we can interact easily over the, over the frontiers in Canada and other areas to develop that. And um, I think what, we, what it could offer in a cooperation, in new chains, as we always like to work with new partners, with new business areas, is that there is a potential um, uh, good margin to go into some new markets in the food processing. And I hope you got out of this story on one end the business model and on the other end the pure business end of that. So I'll leave it for that because the questions we have prepared will uh, give you ample uh, opportunity to, uh, to go into details. Some urgent questions are welcome. Where are you sourcing your product? Are you sourcing it at the processing facility and that whole product or whatever that's left behind? Or, you know, I can think of vegetable processing in this province where a lot of product gets left right in the field. They, their, their trucks are full, they've harvested enough peas for the day, they can't take any more and they just bypass the crop and it's left behind. We never, we never take field product because in my quality assurance system, I cannot work with a field product. But for example, the, the carrot processing facility where we have our joint venture with, in the preparation of the field carrots into the, the mini snacks or the, the half produce for catering or the preparation for the, um, the freezing industry, they have about 20% waste. And that 20%, which is already in a certified system, if you look about traceability, that's where I source my, source my raw material. And we do that with our local partner, but we also do it with if you talk about organic, there are specialized uh, units where they process a lot of organic vegetables and we contract with them, but we never contract ahead of time. Of course, we have contacts and we talk, but we buy the stuff when we sell, have sold that truckload again. But we don't source from the field. And we don't source either, because that's another question which often comes up, from uh, super, uh, retail returns because that is not for us in the volume and we, we typically produce 25 tons of product uh, of end product in a day and you can't have that from small packages from the supermarket you need some bulk in that any other urgent question okay thank you and i'll give the floor to